The first question is our panelist uh, is Richard. Richard, one moment, you were a strong, healthy man, standing talking to Brian. The next, you had collapsed on the ground. In that moment, your aorta was tearing and particles went to your brain, causing a stroke. As you look back, what helped you the most in recovering from both surgery and that stroke? Well, um, I, th I, I, I have to say, number one was my faith in God. And, um, leaving it to him um, really helped me through a lot of this. <clears throat> and secondly, my, my family, uh, support from my family, um, my wife and my daughter. Uh, that was very inspirational to me. Um, and then thirdly, I would have to say it came from from inside me. And I think this uh, some of the things that Arliss talked about this morning of uh, having that hope. Uh, um, if you go on the website, you'll see after one year, um, I ran I ran five miles uh, to through determination. Um, just wanting to get back to normal. And Arliss talked about that. Just wanting to be um, just back in society again. I got out of the hospital, and well, my group of clients, you know, am I going to be able to do their tax return? Because my, I went in, my operation, <coughs> my dissection was February uh, on 4th, right? February 4th. And, uh, April 15th is uh, tax deadline. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and I was in uh, the hospital one month, so that puts me into March. Now, am I going to do these, are they going to look for new, a new, somebody else to do their tax returns, or am I going to, well, I determined to do them, and so um, um, uh, I did, uh, I, d I only asked one client out of all that, because I was determined to, uh, these tax returns. And this question is for Michael Kirk. Michael, you were in a very vulnerable situation for several days when the pain from your aortic dissection went undiagnosed. You are actively working to raise awareness, <clears throat> and your background as a cardiac nurse has been helpful in making contacts. If you were to relive the experience of your dissection again, what do you think would be most effective in getting a prompt scan of your aorta? One of the first things would be knowing a family history if possible. For us, we didn't do autopsies on my family, who we believe died from aortic dissections because of the way that they presented to the hospitals and the way that they were cleared weeks before their deaths. And I think that if I knew that I had an aortic dissection in my family that it would help the doctors decide to scan me or not. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I have gained from this is that my friends who are ER nurses that are ICU nurses that work in hospitals and my physician friends need to know that we don't fit a mold. We can't fit a square peg into a round hole. And the research that is coming out now that truly aortic dissection can be a familial disease and we are becoming younger and younger diagnosed with having these difficulties. They looked at me saying, you know, as I said earlier, I'm short, I'm stumpy, I don't have heart disease, and I don't have the typical back pain, I don't have a history of it, and you have to be crazy to be here. They discounted me many times, as I said earlier. Uh, and going back to the hospital and showing them that I am still alive and that I have learned from this and hopefully they will learn from my experience in helping others be scanned earlier. Uh, I, I know when I first got sick, my family did research and they did find Arliss and they found the foundation and that was a big help for my family to figure out there are people out there and they have this information. Uh, 
to help us as families learn to be able to speak to our physicians and what we can ask for. Uh, but the big thing is for me is educating my friends who are the educators of other nurses and other healthcare professionals, which I'm trying to do uh, with the information for our acute aortic syndrome. In, in having the physicians believe me as a patient and believe what I am going through and telling them is truly what's happening. Uh, they got the opportunity to figure out that that's not what they did. They didn't listen to me. And when they found out that there was something majorly wrong, they went, holy moly, we really didn't listen to them. And uh, Carrie said being an advocate for your own self and also having a family member being an advocate. My wife would not let them send me home. So uh, advocacy for yourself and for your family and knowing if you can to have a Family history of this disease helps the, the healthcare professionals really understand that you might have a disease process that they're not going to look for. Thank you. The next question is for Jan Lopez. <clears throat> we took pictures at this conference last year, and, and if you look at them, some of them on the website, you see Jen smiling. Her eyes are sparkling. She had just learned that at that time that she would need a heart transplant. So it's a year later, and Jen, you have pioneered new ground, receiving a new heart last December. So I wondered, what would you like to tell other young men and women who have just learned that they have a familial form of thoracic aortic disease? Um, first thing I would say is that it's not the end of the world. Second is that um, technology is advancing every day by the minute, as well as new medications and new drugs, as well as different types of um, imaging, which is what we talked about, 64 slices, MRIs, with and without contrast, BP meds are getting better, um, and now I'm involved with immune suppressant drugs, and that's getting better and better, thankfully. I'm not scoring hair on my chest <laughs> or on my ears yet. <laughs> the third thing I would say is um, to find a doctor who is passionate to work with you as well as compassionate and to not settle for just any doctor. To not hesitate to ask questions and to not hesitate to ask for help or support. The fourth thing is to not give up to remain strong of self, especially um, with the knowledge that this is not a death sentence. With the transplant, it's given me a new life. But even before that, I didn't give up. I had a great team behind me, and for some reason, I just had no doubt whatsoever that I was gonna survive, even when my other family members didn't. The fifth thing is, I would say, to listen to your body and be aware of its limitations, but to also juggle to maintain a normal life. This is the hardest for me to practice, just because it's, I, I had a formerly damaged heart, so that limited me physically on what I could and couldn't do. But now that I have a new heart, it's given me more energy, but then I also have a dissection to think about that's limited me to certain aspects of life, but, we still have hope that I can fix that dissection and go back to a normal life. And that's, that's all that counts, having that hope. The sixth thing I would say is to do research on your family members and who might have the disease. Awareness of possible symptoms that occur with them that you may not be aware of will help you in the long run. You may not have those symptoms like leg pains or lower backs, lower back pains or headaches, but you never know if other family members may develop that. And that knowledge will help them and anybody else in this room. And lastly, I would say um, to find a support group or system that you can sound off your frustrations or even to, even to just yell and scream at when you're feeling so angry and frustrated. 